Um, I am Dr. Sayares from Respiratory Department. My main interest in, in pneumology is in interstitial lung disease and pulmonary fibrosis. But <clears throat> in recent, in, when these epidemics start, uh, we realized that some of the effects of some of the injuries that this virus has in the lung, doing the lung, that, uh, are very similar to what we see, what we are seeing in interstitial lung disease, in some interstitial lung disease. So first of all, this is our virus. I have to say that we have an uncertainty ahead uh, from the uh, point of view that uh, most of the things from the virus are still uh, not known. Uh, so it's possible that some of the data that we have now uh, could be different in, in, the, in the, follow, the following weeks, especially uh, because this um, research is going faster. So I am always saying that maybe I'm going to regret of what I will say today in a month. So, because really uh, the virus uh, take us, took us by surprise. Um, some of the research that still we are doing now are trying to understand what's happening and what are the complex effects of this virus in, in, our, in the system, no? especially in the respiratory system. So first of all, I'm going to talk about pathogenesis of COVID-19 uh, focused mainly in what I think is the effects of the lung. Then we're talking about radiology, and how the different stages that we could see, that we can see in the, in the COVID-19 infection. Then we will talk about the lung injury, uh, how the different, uh, if the different effects of the COVID-19 in the lung injury and what we know now. Um, then we are going to start to talk about potential mid and long-term lung sequelae in COVID-19. We will have some data about that, so some data about that. And then finally, we will have some conclusions. It's important that we talk about pathogenesis of COVID-19 to understand what's happening in the lung in these patients. This is a, I think now classic uh, slide from the uh, work of Siddiqui published in the Journal of Heart and Lung Transplantation. Because I think it's important the rationale of, of and the idea of what is happening in COVID-19. So we're saying that at the beginning, we have like an initial response that it's mainly associated to virus. And then this, this is where we have this syndrome uh, symptoms and then and we have some clinical signs related to these clinical symptoms mm -hmm. and then later we have a uh, host inflammatory response phase that we normally see that in different infections but mainly in the particular story of, of COVID-19 is that this response is maybe higher and prolonged, more prolonged in time than what we see in other infections. So this inflammatory response is what in patients that are having uh, a worsening in his respiratory failure. So finally, they need to uh, be admitted in ICU. And mainly this, we see in these patients that they have elevated inflammatory markers. You know? So this is why we're saying that at the beginning, we have to do therapies that are related to the viral response. But later, we have to introduce some uh, therapies related to the immunomodulation of this host, host inflammatory response phase. This is another picture of the same story. So we see that in a patient that enters in this severe uh, pneumonia stage, that all the inflammatory factors here are increasing. We have some presence, still persistent presence of the virus. 
and then we see as a response of this inflammatory factor and also an increase, an increase in the T-dimer. So a uh, decrease in the T and B cells in blood. Here we have this peak of also virus, but if we have a therapy that modulates the inflammatory response and also maybe the uh, controls the thrombotic uh, phenomen phenomena associated with uh, virus, uh, we could see a decrease in the inflammatory response that also take us to the recovery. So the patient didn't enter, doesn't enter in this hyperinflammatory stage. So we is not necessary any respiratory support because by himself, the patient recovers because he's uh, capable to control the inflammatory response. We have to understand that radiology is the manifestation of, of what's happening in the, in the lung. No? The main, there are many uh, uh, manuscripts, there are many papers that talk about the different signs that we can see in the radiology of COVID, but for me it's important to talk about that the radiological signs that we see in COVID-19 are clearly needs to be clearly associated with which stage of the disease we are. Because in different stages of the disease, in different radiological stages and time sequence, sequences, uh, we have different signs. And it's important because it could help us to, to understand if what is feeling the patient is related to the normal progression of the COVID-19 or is something else. So this is Pang and colleagues in this radiology paper show us or propose us these four stages, one early stage, second progressive stage from five to eight days, a peak stage of 19, three days, and 14 days, the absorption stage after the onset of the initial symptom. And in this stage, the infection was controlled and the consolidation was gradually absorbed. And you don't see any crazy paving pattern. And you can see this GGO as a part of the demonstration that there is an absorption of the consolidation. So this could be a normal evolution of a not complicated COVID-19 pneumonia. This is an example of what these authors were showing us. So we see that this typical progression, this is from the early to the progressive peak stages and the absorption, absorption stage. It's relevant that these uh, authors include patients that were not severe patients, patients that were not in the ICU. This is another important uh, publication about the radiological signs. And also I like this publication because also it's related to the, this, how this, uh, this time sequence is changing, you know, from the perspective of radiology in the different weeks. So here we have this subclinical part in which you don't see, mainly you see ground glass opacity in the first part of the, in, in, in the first group, that it's in the initial, in the onset of symptoms, before the onset of symptoms and was more subclinical uh, uh, symptoms. And what you see in the group two, three, and four, that progressively as you progress the symptoms, you see less uh, ground glass and reticular opacities appear, appear and also mixed uh, pattern appear and also consolidation is important. Here is the group three between two and one and two weeks after the symptom of onset and from two weeks to three weeks you can see less consolidation so the consolidation is decreasing and recovering and then you see the, the increase of this mixed pattern and the clear appearance of the reticular pattern. Okay, so how we translate this pathogenesis radiological changes to what we see in the lung. 
first, it's, it's a, this is a nice paper about what normally this, the patterns that the pathologist uh, sees when you have a patient with an acute lack injury. So normally what we mainly we see is diffuse alveolar damage, the AD, that is clearly associated normally with we see with the ADS syndrome. But although it's not frequent, we see other patterns. But in in when a patient appears with acute lack injury. Uh, you have the first one, it could be acute fever and organizing pneumonia. This is a rare pattern described in some cases of, of, of acute lack injury. Typical eosinophilic pneumonia, diffuse alveolar hemorrhage with capillaritis, or also, although normally it's not so clear in most severe patients, we can also see areas of organizing pneumonia. But normally what we see when we have acute lack injury is diffuse alveolar damage. And this is, we don't have too many uh, pathological studies because in most countries we couldn't do autopsies uh, for determining the, the different patterns associated with COVID-19 because the risk of, of infection that we have and we didn't do too much trans trans uh, transbronchial biopsies because uh, the risk of, of, of transmission of COVID-19. But for example, in this case, uh, this is one of the first and most, well, with most cases, the, the, the study from Northern Italy. And we see that all, we have different stages of, of, uh, of diffuse alveolar uh, damage, as we expect. And it was one of the main patterns that we see in, in, this, uh, in this disease. Also, it's important that we have the appearance of some microthrombus, uh, organizing microthrombus in the, in the pathologies, uh, uh, and in the pathology samples that, that we have, you know, pathology examples that we have. But also, this is from a French study, we see that acute fibrinous organizing pneumonia is also important. And in this case, <coughs> from seven patients that uh, we have histological samples, seven, six, sorry, six have this pattern. So it's possible that also in, in COVID-19 we have uh, the appearance of this pattern more frequently that we normally observe in in other infections and other ARDS patients. And it's interesting because we, now we are doing in our center pulmonary biopsies after uh, if the, well, the, in the case of patients that die. And we see that the first one that we had is this pattern of acute fibrinous, fibrinous oxygen pneumonia, organizing pneumonia, sorry. Uh, AFOP, it seems, and we have more cases of if AFOP. Well, you have this part of ox, uh, organization with the presence of this five fibrin, organizing fibrin, organized fibrin. Um, so it's interesting to see that maybe it's not only the AD what we have. So we have other patterns that maybe organizing pneumonia is also important. And from my perspective of view, it's important because <clears throat> some of the inflammatory persist, uh, the, some of the inflammatory um, biomarkers that we see persistent during time could be related to, to this uh, pathology, you no? Know? And in this case, maybe uh, immunomodulation is more important than what we have in the AG. No, it's just an hypothesis. So what we have of mid and long-term lung sequela. So, sequela. so we all have too much information now, but we have some. When we talk of possibility of mid-term complications, we have one of our observations is what we call non-resolving pneumonitis. We, this is uh, a concept that we are have defined for the what we are seeing in the in our patients, this is a 
a proposal that we have from our group that this, there is a phenotype of patients that present this complication. But it's also frequent uh, alterations of coagulation and especially pulmonary embolism. And also, obviously, complications of after as distress syndrome from mechanical ventilation that we know from other from other uh, from other infection as well could be tracheostomy, the post distress syndrome, the ICU myopathy, etc. But we have could have potential long term complications as lung fibrosis, bronchiectasis, in these cases of pulmonary embolism, maybe pulmonary hypertension, or exercise limitation in the future. It was important this concept because and it created some debate in the society. In fact, when we started doing this post-COVID clinics, it goes directly to one of the most important this new as a new in the one of the most important newspaper in the country. The has created also in the ILD community uh, some concern, and this is one of the most important uh, perspectives uh, published in this case with uh, from Paulus Pandor and colleagues, uh, and published in the Lancet Respiratory Medicine, talking about the possibility of that pulmonary fibrosis could be a, a, an important issue here. But what do we know about potential sequela COVID, following COVID infection? We don't know too much. Uh, has been described that acute respiratory syndrome and middle aged respiratory syndrome could have some patients have developed fibrosis, but we don't have too many information about the follow up of these patients. And there's also reported in other viral infections the presence of organizing pneumonia by this virus. This is a figure that tries to. Uh, compare the different infections, recent infections of SARS, MERS, and COVID-19. So we know that some patients we don't have imaging, initially imaging. The age, the acute phase is very similar, also it's very similar that we don't have too much pneumothorax normally, and not cavitation only for the neopathy. And it's important here in COVID-19 is that the, maybe we have more consolidation than in in other infections and also the relation of consolidation and ground glass opacities. Uh, this index also expressed it's uh, an indication of poor prognosis when you have more consolidated areas than ground glass areas. In the chronic phase, we don't have any data now from COVID-19, but I will show you some initial data from our cohort of patients that we are following. Um, but as we said, fibrosis could be an option. And we see transient reticular opacities in GSRs and MERS. We have defined, we have defined this kind of phenotype in our, our group that we have consistently seen in our patient. It is, we have called it persistent pneumonitis. Uh, and in patients with COVID-19 confirmed infection, we shall see that a group of patients after 40 days of a set of symptoms have persistent pulmonary opacities. And it's not explained by other infection or other pathology that explain this persistence. And it's interesting because most of them have a characteristic pattern in the radiology, specifically different degrees of bilateral ground glass opacities with peripheral linear and periboloblar consolidations. Some of them with a reverse allo appearance associated with bronchial dilatation and architectural distortion. We can see here an example of what we're saying. That this is normally what we're saying, organizing pattern or organizing changes. And we don't know, we don't have a, a, a pathological, uh, histological histology from this, from the CT scans. But uh, we have from biopsies that we are doing, Mortem, and we see that in many cases we see these organizing areas also in the in the pathology that we are seeing after in this in those cases that the patient that had died. This is with this uh, pattern we follow up. This is the initial analysis of, of the patients that we follow up. Now we have more than one hundred, and in this initial fifty three patients we see that 
you do see a pattern, no? So not many patients were smokers and not many patients have uh, chronic diseases. So we see here different respiratory failure stages or, 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 or situations we, we see in these patients. Normally they have bilateral opacity site admission and spe specifically most of them uh, in our center, we did, we did initially this therapy with hydroxychloroquine and acetromycin and the combination with lopinavir and ritonavir. And half of, of the patients, half percent of the patients were in received the series map. It's interesting compare the analytical or the biological parameters from hospital admission to at the time of CT scanning. So we see, for example, that Although CR, C, uh, C reactive protein was high, the hospital admission decreased at the time of skinning, but ferritin was still persistently high with high levels of, of ferritin. Also, day dimer was increased during this period, and procalcitonin was low, so it was, we didn't see too much over, a, over uh, infections of uh, bacteria or, or other pathogens. It's interesting that we see that this kind of phenotype happens in five to eight persons of, from all the COVID pneumonia patients that we enter. And not many, not all the patients were in the ICU, so only 35% have high flux of oxygen. And 15% were, uh, were with intensive me mechanical ventilation. Um, all patients in our case are following our protocol, receive systemic corticosteroids when this persistence was detected. And only, but only one patient died from this initial group of patients and no requirement of oxygen support except in four patients. As a limitation, we didn't do bronchoscopy in, initially when it was detected by the CT scan, this, this phenotype. But as I told you, interestingly, in recent data that we have, when this patient die, I will do the biopsy. Most of them have these organizing changes and most of them have also a fall. So this is the important story. So maybe here, what we do here in this inflammatory stage, it's important to reduce this persistence of symptoms after days of the initial viremia phase and to try to reduce uh, potential uh, complications in the lung later. We don't have functional studies, but this one is the only one I know from China. And we see that although if VC is preserved, and this is interesting because they do, they did just yeah, at the end of the, of the, of the admission that we don't normally know that and that, at that stage, functional changes, is at its, it's normal. No? So, but it's interesting that we see that in severe pneumonia, we have this decrease of TLCO that not appear in FVC or TLC. But the problem is fibrosis here also. This is one example from the um, manuscript that I told you before, that we see that when in areas that we see, peripheral areas that we see, ground glass opacity is then we could see some uh, bronchial dilatations and the initial maybe of lamp fibrosis. We have some examples. We are following these persistent pneumonitis patients after one month. This is the when we have the CT scans after one month of discharge. So we see different examples. For example, in this case, that we see these different opacities in the CT scan. So we have we see uh, how at after a month, many of them resolved. Also here, this is another case. And it's very interesting because here we see, you know, very uh, ex uh, important extension of, of opacities. And here we have bronchial dilatation. And we see that although we still have after one month uh, injury and uh, some areas of with lung injury, we see clearly a reduce of this uh, damage after one month. As patients take corticosteroids after the discharge. Also, we hear with this crazy, sorry, with this crazy pattern, uh, 
uh, because it's crazy paving pattern in the land after one month was resolved. But in some cases, we don't see that. So this is another case that still we have some, some reticular peripheric or subpleural areas of, of injury. And this is a very interesting case in that the patient that initially uh, corticos was prescribed in the ICU, but they do a decrease of 90 to 45 of prednisone and we see a worsening of the infiltrates after doing that. Then the patient again was, these corticoids were again increased, but at that point, after the discharge, the day, this is the day 30, and it was the last day that the patient was admitted. So we, although it was better than before, but still we have these areas of, of particular pattern or interstitial pattern better and after 30 days of, 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 uh, of symptoms. And it's interesting because this patient uh, stopped corticosteroids after, after the discharge. And we see that although from when the pneumonitis, persistent pneumonitis pattern uh, phenotype was de detected, and this is one month after the discharge, we see an improvement, but still in these patients, we have bronchial dilatations and some uh, lesions and uh, injury here with reticular patterns. And, and this patient stopped the corticosteroids after the discharge. So here we have, again, this persistent lung injury after one month. So uh, we think that these patients were the ones that are going to be, have persistent injury and these areas of fibrosis. We didn't see any patient with, with uh, honeycomb. This is important also. So now we have 103 patients following up with this uh, phenotype. We don't know which ones are doing love, will do valve fibrosis or not. We are also having some controls to compare this phenotype and difference with this phenotype. Point here is the effect of corticosteroids. This is something that it's in debate now, um, but we think that in these patients with inflammatory persistence uh, in their evolution, I think that corticosteroids or other kind of immunomodulation could, could be very inter interesting and maybe they necessary, you know, for this patient could progress in their, in, during their stay in the hospital and then for trying to avoid at minimum the lung, uh, the res fibrosis residuals and the lung fibrosis after, after the admission, after the admission in the hospital. But this is an hypothesis and it's something that we are working on on a study, trying to, to have more data to, to see if it's really, if it is, is true or not. We are also studying the mechanism that we can, you know, affect these this, uh, injuries. And we will see in the future, you know, what, what we have found, the results we have in the, with, this, with this area of the non-resolving pneumonitis. So. But the other point is the embolism. So this is one of the manuscripts that have detected that in patients with COVID-19, we are seeing pulmonary embolisms. And some of these patients will need uh, prolonged uh, anticoagulant therapy. This is the, uh, the, the, our data from, from, the, from the initial month of the pandemics. And we see that in 100 uh, CT scans that we do, uh, angio CT scans, uh, only 33 Pulmonary, pulmonary embolism was confirmed. This is the characteristics of this population. Uh, interestingly, we see that in those patients that develop pulmonary embolism, the radio between dendrimer and ferritin was lower than in the non-pulmonary embolism. So maybe this is this kind of two mechanisms that we have in the lung, the coagulation, uh, or alteration and coagulation mechanism with the in, in per inflammation pathway. So, you know, depending on which pathway you are more, as it's more uh, stimulated, you have this kind of 
two different injuries or two at the same time. So this is very interesting data, something that needs to be confirmed, but in the future, pues, we are also working on that. And Dr. Blanco, Dr. Barbara, Dr. Moises, that are part of the uh, vascular uh, unit in our center are working on that. Also important that we see hemorrhagic complications in those patients, specifically one that wants with heparin, so it's an important so, something to, that needs to be controlled, an important problem during these pandemics. And finally, so this is how we are, have organized to follow up these patients. So this is, uh, although this is in Spanish, I'm going to explain you how we are, have organized. Um, we were the first, one of the first uh, um, clinics dedicated to COVID-19. So if the patient, we say that if the patient uh, was not admitted after a COVID infection and they have stayed at home and be followed up by, by the primary care physician. So the primary physician also do the follow up, but if they feel, and this is something that we have seen that these patients have, starts to have symptoms or the, there is a persistence of respiratory symptoms during the follow-up, we do a, 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 a chest x-ray and a spirometry. And if it's okay, then, so we say it's not related to COVID and it's follow-up by, by the primary care. But if we have this, there is a persistence also, so we have that is not clear the spirometry and the x-ray symptoms. So the pulmonary special physician consider these patients and see if they have to send us to us in the hospital. If the pneumonia is not severe, so also it's controlled by the physician, but we say that they have to do a, in all cases, a x-ray chest, a chest x-ray, sorry. And if they see that it's okay. Also, they have to do a spirometry, and if it's normal, so they don't have to do anything. But if you see, they see that there is some uh, images or opacities in the CT scan after the pneumonia that was in, uh, admitted in the hospital, or if there is any alteration in spirometry, they have to consider to uh, to send the patient to the respiratory specialist and they he will decide if they have to sell the to send the, him to the uh, specific uh, clinic in the hospital and this is something very peculiar that we have done in our hospital because as i said we have identified these patients with persistent pneumonitis and we have done treatment prolonged treatment with corticosteroids because we think that this patient that we have to that we have seen clinically they benefit from doing that. And we see that after we, all these patients we have it in this uh, clinic, in this part of the clinic that I'm doing by, by myself. And they do, we do a CT scan and pulmonary function test and we follow them until six months. We also do some analytics, etc. cetera. Uh, also, we have another part of the clinics that is for all the embolisms and follow-up and pulmonary embolism follow-up and another one that is from the follow from the post ICU and post severe pneumonias. Everything all this work has been done thanks to Toro Real Civila that have organized everything and a very complex organization and to, with too many patients it's been very difficult to, to do that. So and in all cases we are doing CT scans and functional tests and we will detect by the six months, I think, who really are those patients that with long-term sequela. So this is all what I have to say. So we have this acute lack injury with damage, uh, uh, diffuse alveolar damage, and what we think that AFIOP is it's an increasing uh, pattern here in the COVID-19 compared to other infections and distress. And also microvascular involvement, it's important in the acute lack injury. We have some midterm problems we have detected and we have, you know, described this non-resolving pneumonitis group. But also we have pulmonary embolism and 
the bleedings associated with the treatment, the ICU long-term sequela. And at the, at the moment, the long-term complications are unknown, but the first point is to say, is, okay, we will have fibrosis in the future or not? This is the, one of the main questions here. So I want to thanks to every one of my department that they have really been into the COVID infection, working hard, which has been very complicated, but they have done perfectly from the people from the ICU, from the uh, clinic, and we have created two, three new uh, uh, areas of, of COVID during these pandemics. So it was a hard work and very good job from all the points of the department and I really want to thank to everyone. So, and thanks for, for you. I hope that in the future we will have more information about the complications and how to treat this infection from the lung perspective. So thank you very much and see you.